So the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has now ruled on the Marcus Gray versus Catherine Elizabeth Hudson case. This is the Flame Joyful Noise versus Katy Perry Dark Horse case. And I'm going to do it my way because I don't want to use clips from Joyful Noise and Dark Horse and then have to fight YouTube and Katy Perry and Flame again. You may remember last time I made this video, I was monetization claimed by Katy Perry, and I was prepared to sue Katy Perry's agents or content owners or whatever, the claimants, for their false claim, but they dropped it fairly quickly thereafter. Obviously, my use of short clips was a fair use, and you know what? The false claims are working. They're having the deterrent effect. I don't want to use clips of their music, no matter how much of a fair use right I have, because I just don't feel like dealing with the false claims and then getting a copyright strike on my channel or getting my money diverted to Katy Perry. I'll just play notes on a piano. So this is a four-publication opinion. That means this is precedential in the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Plaintiffs Marcus Gray, professionally known as Flame, and Catherine Hudson, professionally known as Katy Perry, and Capitol Records and several other defendants, were sued for copyright infringement. The plaintiffs claim that a repeating instrumental figure in musical terms, an ostinato, in Hudson's song, Dark Horse, copied a similar ostinato in plaintiff's song, Joyful Noise. After a trial centering around the testimony of musical experts, a jury found defendants liable for copyright infringement and awarded $2.8 million in damages. The district court vacated the jury award and granted judgment as a matter of law to defendants, concluding principally that the evidence at trial was legally insufficient to show that the joyful noise ostinato was copyrightable original expression. This goes to show you why juries are bad in copyright. When a jury is asked to look at two things and decide if it's copyright infringement, a jury is maybe not educated enough on copyright law to understand the originality requirement, that copyright doesn't protect everything you create or everything about the thing you create. It only protects your original expression. The court's going to go into this in more detail, but my point is that a jury will look at two things that look similar and maybe automatically assume that they are substantially similar enough to be copyright infringement without being able to exclude the non-copyrightable elements from those works. The Ninth Circuit is going to affirm the district court's vacation of the jury decision. So the jury decided in favor of Flame. The judge in the district court overruled that jury, vacated their decision in favor of Katy Perry. The Ninth Circuit is now going to affirm in favor of Katy Perry. Copyright law protects musical works only to the extent that they are original works of authorship. The trial record compels us to conclude that the ostinatos at issue here consist entirely of commonplace musical elements, and that the similarities between them do not arise out of an original combination of those elements. Consequently, the jury's verdict finding defendants liable for copyright infringement was unsupported by the evidence, and therefore can be vacated or, or eliminated, overturned, overruled. We begin by briefly explaining some vocabulary that we rely on throughout this opinion. A musical scale is essentially a sequence of musical notes or tones ordered by pitch, how low or high each note is. To illustrate this concept, a standard piano or keyboard instrument has white and black keys organized in a 12-key repeating pattern. If one starts with any key on the piano and plays 12 white and black keys in order from left to right, she will have played all the notes of a chromatic scale in ascending order. That ordered sequence of 12 notes, which repeats itself at higher or lower registers across the keyboard, can be thought of as the musical equivalent of an artist's coloring palette, as one can rearrange these notes into more complex sequences and add rhythmic or durational variety to create memorable tunes. 
In practice, many songs are based on scales that use only a smaller subset of the 12 notes in the chromatic scale. These scales have different names depending on which notes are chosen. The scale we are primarily concerned with today has seven notes and is called a minor scale. In the key of C, a major scale sounds like this. And a minor scale starts on A and sounds like this. As with other scales, the notes in the minor scale can be referred to with alphabetic names, A, B, C, etc., but the parties have generally opted to refer to them with numerical degrees, indicating each note's ordered position on the scale. You might have also heard this already, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, would be then the octave, the, the repeating Do. We agree that approach is more convenient here. The image below, taken from the beginning of Defendant's answering brief, illustrates how numerical scale degrees correspond to different keys on a piano in the minor scale, in this case the key of A. And so A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and they're going to use those numerical degrees throughout this opinion. In 2007, Plaintiff Ojukwu recorded a simple tune using a free music website. He later sold it to Plaintiff Gray, Flame, who used it as an ostinato, or a repeating musical figure, for Joyful Noise. A recording of Joyful Noise first appeared in the album Our World Redeemed in 2008. While Joyful Noise did not achieve significant commercial success or playtime on the radio, it received millions of views on YouTube and on Gray's MySpace page. Our World Redeemed was also nominated for a Grammy Award in the Best Rock or Rap Gospel Album category in 2009. Defendants, Katy Perry, created Dark Horse in 2013. Hudson's trial testimony was that she met with two of her co-defendants at a recording studio and sampled several short musical fragments to consider using them in a new song. The segment Hudson responded to most positively became the ostinato for Dark Horse. Dark Horse was first released on the album Prism along with several other tracks. It was a hit, resulting in a music video and a performance by Hudson at the Super Bowl halftime show in 2015. The following features of the two ostinatos are undisputed. Both ostinatos are based on a minor scale, although they are in different keys, meaning that they treat different notes or keys on a piano as the first note of the scale. The Dark Horse ostinato is made up of eight notes, 16 when repeated, which correspond to the minor scale degrees 3-3-3-3-2-2-1-5. While the Joyful Noise Ostinato is made up of two slightly different eight-note figures, 16 notes when combined, that correspond to the minor scale degrees 3-3-3-3-2-2-2-1, three, 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 two, 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 and then 3-3-3-3-2-2-2-6. Three, 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 two, 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 So while each eight note pattern begins with 3-3-3-3-2-2, three, 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 two, two, they differ in the last two notes, leaving aside some stylistic embellishment in Joyful Noise, specifically the use of portmento or sliding between notes. Both ostinatos also rely on a completely uniform rhythm, meaning each note is of equal duration in time, sounds like quarter notes in the songs. Plaintiffs filed their operative complaint. Plaintiffs put forth Dr. Todd Decker as an expert witness. The heart of Dr. Decker's testimony concerned which specific elements of the ostinatos in Dark Horse and Joyful Noise were similar. Dr. Decker testified that the length of each ostinato is similar, eight notes, the rhythm is similar, the melodic content, the scale degrees present, the melodic shape, so the way the melody moves through the musical space, similar, the timbre or the quality and color of the sound is similar, and the use of the placement of this material, this ostinato, in the musical space of the recording in the mix is also similar. So that's five or six points of similarity between the two ostinatos. However, Dr. Decker also said that there was no one single element that caused him to believe the ostinatos at issue were substantially similar when viewed in isolation. Rather, while any single one of those elements would not have been enough, it was the combination of them that led Dr. Decker to conclude that Joyful Noise and Dark Horse had substantially similar ostinatos. 
He also admitted that the ostinatos were different in some respects, though he clarified that he did not think this negated the similarities between them. The jury also heard testimony from defendant's expert, Dr. Lawrence Ferrara, who disagreed with Dr. Decker's assessment that the ostinatos were substantially similar. He noted the use of different scale degrees at the end of each ostinato, pointing out that Dark Horse has a leap from 1 to 5, while Joyful Noise uses a stepwise motion from 2 to 1 at the corresponding point in time. In addition, Dr. Ferrara explained that two well-known songs, Jolly Old St. Nicholas and Merrily We Roll Along, which has the same tune as Mary Had a Little Lamb, also use the 3-3-3-3-2-2 pitch sequence that Dark Horse and Joyful Noise ostinatos share. This testimony was not refuted, though Dr. Decker dismissed its importance to the similarity inquiry, nor was Dr. Ferrara's testimony that three other pieces of music predating Joyful Noise also used pitch progressions proceeding from 3 to 2 to 1 played in an even rhythm. Love Me or Hate Me, which was composed by defendant Lucas Gottwald, or Dr. Luke, and Brainchild and Choosing Life. For each phase of the trial, the jury was instructed on the law and given a special verdict form. Among other conclusions, the jury found specifically that Dark Horse used protected material from Joyful Noise, and the two songs contained substantially similar copyrightable expression. That defendants had a reasonable opportunity to hear Joyful Noise before composing Dark Horse, because the other half of the substantial similarity inquiry is access to the original copyrighted work. So you need access and substantial similarity. The jury also found that plaintiffs were entitled to 22.5% of defendants' net profits from Dark Horse, resulting in a total verdict of about $2.8 million in damages. After the trial, defendants moved for judgment as a matter of law or for a new trial. The district court vacated the jury's verdict and granted the judgment as a matter of law motion. The district court's 32-page decision rejected all of defendants' challenges to the jury verdict except their argument that the ostinatos were not substantially similar. Citing Dr. Decker's testimony, the district court reasoned that none of the individual points of similarity the expert identified between Dark Horse and Joyful Noise constituted copyrightable original expression. The district court also did not believe that the combination of these elements constituted original expression. Alternatively, the district court concluded that this combination merited no more than a thin copyright, which is infringed only by virtually identical works. The district court determined that there were enough objective distinctions between the ostinatos such that they were not virtually identical. Plaintiffs appealed, we review, brand new, a district court's grant of judgment as a matter of law. The operative question is whether a reasonable jury would have had a legally sufficient evidentiary basis to conclude that defendants engaged in copyright infringement. So this is one of the rare circumstances where a jury made a decision that was not based on uh, sufficient factual evidence. The applicable standards are essentially the same as those for a summary judgment motion, meaning we must draw all reasonable inferences in plaintiff's favor. Along these lines, we must disregard all evidence favorable to defendants that a jury is not required to believe, but we should also give credence to evidence supporting defendants that is uncontradicted and unimpeached, at least to the extent that the evidence comes from disinterested witnesses. Copyright protection only extends to works that contain original expression. Original, as the term is used in copyright, means only that the work was independently created by the author and that it possesses at least some minimal degree of creativity. You might remember the Elderwood hex box case, which is now going to trial. The Elderwood or Three Frog trademark application was on a basic hexagonal shape of a box with seven hexagonal cuts in it as storage spaces. Elderwood and Three Frog had applied for copyright protection on that shape. And because that shape is not an original expression, it does not owe its authorship to them originally. They weren't the first ones to do it. And it does not possess a minimal degree of creativity. Therefore, the Copyright Office denied the copyrightability of that, and the copyrightability or, or lack of copyrightability of that shape became one of Mr. Taylor's arguments in his opposition to the trademarkability 
of that shape. We agree with the district court that plaintiffs failed to establish copying of any original and therefore protected elements of joyful noise. For that reason, we affirm its decision to vacate the jury award and grant judgment as a matter of law to defendants. We need not reach any other issue in this case. The legal framework for copyright infringement. Because plaintiffs did not present any direct evidence that defendants copied Joyful Noises ostinato, they were required to show that one, defendants had access to their work, and two, the ostinatos in Joyful Noise and Dark Horse are substantially similar. In other words, if there was direct evidence that Katy Perry heard Joyful Noise and said, oh, I like that ostinato, put that ostinato in Dark Horse. That would be direct evidence, that would be actual copying, and therefore the substantial similarity inquiry does not need to be made. But that's not what happened here. They made this independently, and therefore the substantial similarity test applies. We need not address the access prong because we may resolve this case based on the substantially similar prong. For that requirement, we have traditionally determined whether copying sufficient to constitute infringement has taken place under a two-part test. This is the extrinsic and intrinsic test. Both tests must be satisfied for the works to be deemed substantially similar. So the tests are sort of layered in a hierarchy. If you don't have actual copying, you require access and substantial similarity. When you're evaluating the substantial similarity requirement, that falls down into another two-part test, extrinsic versus intrinsic. The extrinsic test will have one set of requirements. The intrinsic test will have a different set of requirements. The court's going to go over that now. The extrinsic test considers whether two works share a similarity of ideas and expression as measured by external, objective criteria. The extrinsic test requires breaking the works down into their constituent elements and comparing those elements for proof of copying as measured by substantial similarity. Because the requirement is one of substantial similarity to protected elements of the copyrighted work, it is essential to distinguish between protected and unprotected material in a plaintiff's work. The intrinsic test focuses on similarity of expression from the standpoint of the ordinary, reasonable observer with no expert assistance. At oral argument and in their briefing, plaintiffs argued that we are required to defer to the jury's determination that the joyful noise and dark horse ostinatos are substantially similar. But even when juries serve as the fact finders, judges retain an important gatekeeping role in applying the law. To be sure, the intrinsic test for substantial similarity is uniquely suited for determination by the trier of fact. In this case, the trier of fact is the jury because of its focus on the lay listener. So this court must be reluctant to reverse a jury's finding that two works are intrinsically similar. So while we must refrain from usurping the jury's traditional role of evaluating witness credibility and weighing the evidence, the extrinsic test requires us as a court to ensure that whatever objective similarities the evidence establishes between two works are legally sufficient to serve as the basis of a copyright infringement claim, regardless of the jury's views. Because the extrinsic test for substantial similarity requires us to distinguish between protected and unprotected material in a plaintiff's work, the threshold issue is what, if anything, about the joyful noise ostinato qualifies as original expression that can serve as the basis for a copyright infringement claim. And they quote to Feist, which was the phone book case, where a competitor had copied the phone book listings of a previous phone book. The numbers in the phone book were considered to be facts and therefore not original, but the plaintiff had put fake phone numbers in there so they could track who was copying their numbers and that copying of the fake numbers was considered to be copyright infringement because those fake numbers were an original expression even if it was meant to catch counterfeiters or, or copiers. They also quote to Skidmore, substantial similarity test focuses on the protectable elements standing alone and disregards the non-protectable elements. Although copyright protects only original expression, it is not difficult to meet the famously low bar for originality, fake phone book numbers. 
The requisite level of creativity is extremely low. Even a slight amount will suffice. The vast majority of works make the grade quite easily, as they possess some creative spark no matter how crude, humble, or obvious it might be. But even in the face of this low threshold, copyright does require at least a modicum of creativity and does not protect every aspect of a work. Ideas, concepts, and common elements are excluded. Nor does copyright extend to common or trite musical elements or commonplace elements that are firmly rooted in the genre's tradition, c'est affair. These building blocks belong in the public domain and cannot be exclusively appropriated by a particular author. Under the Senna Fair doctrine, when certain commonplace expressions are indispensable and naturally associated with the treatment of a given idea, those expressions are treated like ideas, and therefore not protected by copyright. So having a spaceship in space in your space opera production does not mean that you own the exclusive right to put spaceships in space in all creative expressions till the end of your copyright protection. No, that's Senna Fair, maybe even factual. You need to have spaceships in space. You need to have two people meeting in a romantic comedy. You need to have certain elements in order to make a basic expression in a genre. The trial record here requires us to conclude that no single point of similarity between Joyful Noise and Dark Horse arises out of a protectable form of expression. For this issue, it is arguably sufficient that plaintiff's expert musicologist candidly testified that any single one of those elements would not have been enough for him to conclude that substantial similarity existed, and that only the combination of those elements led him to this conclusion. I mean, that's a fair conclusion, right? If, if I make a new piano piece using all the keys on the keyboard, but it's just piano notes put together, well, any one note is not protectable, therefore my entire expression is not protectable. Not quite. There is a threshold where it goes from too simple to be copyrighted, to be recognized as your original creativity, to now complex and long enough and creative enough to be protectable. Nonetheless, Dr. Decker testified as an expert musicologist, not as an expert on copyright law. For that reason, we provide a brief overview of the individual musical elements identified by plaintiffs as original and explain why those elements are not individually entitled to copyright protection. We address whether copyright law protects the combination of those unprotectable elements in the next section. Though it used slightly different terminology, plaintiffs' opening brief focused on essentially the same musical elements adding that both ostinatos were based on the minor scale. The evidence at trial was legally insufficient to establish that these musical elements are individually copyrightable. We note that Dr. Decker himself acknowledged that many of these elements are commonplace in the musical world, even if some aspects of Joyful Noise and Dark Horse were unusual for their respective genres. For example, Apart from concluding that there are many songs predating the creation of Joyful Noise that have ostinatos, Dr. Decker explained that it is characteristic for musical phrases playing a role similar to the ostinatos at issue here to last for eight beats. And while Dr. Decker opined that it is uncommon to use completely even rhythms in popular music, he also testified that the use of such a rhythm in Joyful Noise and Dark Horse was a relatively simple rhythmic choice that no composer is entitled to monopolize. Plaintiffs adduced no evidence at trial contradicting their own expert's testimony, suggesting that these shared elements of these two ostinatos are merely common musical building blocks belonging to the public domain. Even leaving aside these admissions, our precedents and other persuasive decisions make clear that no element identified by plaintiff or Dr. Decker is individually copyrightable. Plainly, no person may copyright the minor scale, as such scales are common musical building blocks belonging to the public. The fact that Joyful Noise and Dark Horse both make use of sequences of eight notes played in an even rhythm is a similarly trite musical choice outside the protection of copyright law. Along somewhat different lines, the fact that Joyful Noise and Dark Horse arguably have similar textures is far too abstract of a similarity to be legally cognizable. Dr. Decker's remark that the ostinatos have a similar timbre also does not help plaintiffs. 
Dr. Decker explained that timbre is a way of describing a sound's quality. For example, the clarinet and the piano playing the same notes will sound noticeably different. Dr. Decker testified that the synthesizers used to play the joyful noise and dark horse ostinatos have similar timbres because both use sounds that are artificial, are high in register, and seem pingy, among other similar descriptors. But a copyright to a musical work does not give one the right to assert ownership over the sound of a synthesizer any more than the sound of a trombone or a banjo. For one, plaintiffs have sued only for infringement of their copyright in Joyful Noise as a musical composition. In contrast, the choice of a particular instrument, whether acoustic or electronic, to play a tune relates to the performance or recording of a work, which are protected by distinct copyrights. In Williams v. Gay, the Marvin Gaye case, it is well established that sound recordings and musical compositions are separate works with their own distinct copyrights, the court said. In Newton v. Diamond, I believe is Neil Diamond, the court distinguished between elements protected by the plaintiff's copyright over the musical composition at issue and those attributable to his performance of the piece or the sound recording. More generally, the use of synthesizers to accompany vocal performers has long been commonplace in popular music. Along these lines, Dr. Decker conceded that timbre is one of the very difficult things to monopolize. That leaves us with plaintiff's contention that the pitch sequence utilized by the Joyful Noise Ostinato is copyrightable. And with Dr. Decker's related comments that the two ostinatos use similar scale degrees and have similar or same melodic content and shape. At this point, it is necessary to distinguish between an abstract sequence of pitches and a melody, or more colloquially, a tune, Though the concepts are sometimes equated, creating a melody involves more than writing down a sequence of pitches. At a minimum, that sequence must also be rhythmically organized so as to form an aesthetic whole. While the eight-note melody may be copyrightable, the abstract eight-note pitch sequence that is a component of the melody is not. We note, haha, that this conclusion is consistent with the rule that chord progressions may not be individually protected, because they are basic musical building blocks. Chords are ultimately just a combination of pitches played simultaneously. So a chord progression itself consists of multiple pitch sequences playing out at the same time. If the chord progression cannot be protected, the individual pitch sequences forming the progression cannot be either. Turning finally to the ostinato's melodic shape, Dr. Decker described this as the way the melody moves through the musical space. He explained that scale degrees have in them tendencies. There are scale degrees that want to go somewhere, the cycle of fifths, for example, and scale degrees that say, you're home, like one. Later in his testimony, he elaborated that three wants to go to two, and two wants to go to one because one is our home note. Applying this concept to the joyful noise in Dark Horse Ostinatos, he testified that the repetition of scale degree 3 in both songs created tension that wants to be released, and it's released to scale degree 2 on a particularly strong beat. As with musical texture, it could be argued that the overall shape of a melody as described by Dr. Decker is nothing more than an abstraction outside the protection of copyright law. In any event, as the district court recognized Dr. Decker's explanation that the two ostinatos moved through musical space in similar ways simply reflects rules of consonance common in popular music. Just as films often rely on tropes to tell a compelling story, music uses standard tools to build and resolve dramatic tension. In this vein, courts have recognized that while there are an enormous number of possible permutations of the musical notes of the scale, only a few are pleasing. This is also underscored, haha, by the fact that uncontradicted evidence at trial showed that two songs predating Joyful Noise, Merrily We Roll Along and Jolly Old St. Nicholas, used the same pitch sequence, albeit in the major scale rather than the minor scale, and melodic shape. Evidence of similar musical phrases appearing in prior works demonstrates that the musical language was of such ordinary and commonplace occurrence that the probability of independent, coincidental production was great. Because the use of similar pitch sequences in the joyful noise and dark horse ostinatos results only from the use of commonplace, unoriginal music principles, it cannot be the basis for a copyright infringement claim on its own. On to the combination 
of these ostinatos into a song. So the overall feel of the song, I was going to say look and feel, but it's not a look. The overall sound and feel doesn't have the same ring to it. Although no individual musical component of the Joyful Noise Ostinato is copyrightable, we must still consider whether the Joyful Noise Ostinato is protectable as a combination of unprotectable elements. That is the case only if the selection and arrangement of those elements is original in some way. And that goes back to the Feist case, that the phone book company made up some numbers and arranged them, selected them and arranged them in a particular way, and that can be creative and can be protectable. We begin this analysis with some guiding principles. To start, the fact that the ostinatos here are only eight notes long does not foreclose the possibility of a protected arrangement of commonplace musical elements. It cannot be said as a matter of law that seven notes is too short a length to garner copyright protection. Each note in a scale is not protectable, but a pattern of notes in a tune may earn copyright protection. On the other hand, despite the famously low bar for originality, trivial elements of compilation and arrangement fall below the threshold of originality. One circumstance where an arrangement of individual elements lacks enough creativity to garner copyright protection is when that arrangement is practically inevitable or in keeping with an old age practice, firmly rooted in tradition and so commonplace that it has come to be expected as a matter of course. For example, it is well settled that copyright of a map does not give the author an exclusive right to the coloring, symbols, and key used in delineating boundaries of and locations within the territory depicted. The same is true for an alphabetical arrangement of numbers in a phone book. Feist. These are all utterly conventional ways of arranging information, so that cannot be called original under copyright law. To provide an example in this artistic context, we have held that a lifelike glass jellyfish sculpture enclosed in a clear outer layer of glass did not combine public domain elements in an original way. We did not dispute that the sculptures were beautiful, but we determined that elements such as the selection of clear glass, an oblong shroud, bright colors, proportion, vertical orientation, and stereotyped jellyfish form, considered together, lacked the quantum of originality needed to merit copyright protection. This was because these elements are so commonplace in glass-in-glass -glass sculpture, and so typical of jellyfish physiology, that to recognize copyright protection in their combination effectively would give the artist a monopoly over this art form. Likewise, the portion of the joyful noise ostinato that overlaps with the dark horse ostinato consists of a manifestly conventional arrangement of musical building blocks. Joyful noise and dark horse contain similar arrangements of basic musical progression features mainly in that both employ the pitch progression 333322 played in a completely flat rhythm. This combination is unoriginal because it is really nothing more than a two-note snippet of a descending minor scale with some notes repeated. Allowing a copyright over this material would essentially amount to allowing an improper monopoly over two-note pitch sequences, or even the minor scale itself, especially in light of the limited number of expressive choices available when it comes to an eight-note repeated musical figure. There are relatively few ways to express a combination of five basic elements, in the Skidmore case, in just four measures, especially given the constraints of particular musical conventions and styles. Once the artist settled on using a descending chromatic scale in A minor, there were a limited number of chord progressions that could reasonably accompany that bass line, while still sounding pleasant to the ear. I think Skidmore was the stairway case. Yeah, that was Skidmore v. Led Zeppelin. Consequently, insofar as it combines musical building blocks in the same way that the Dark Horse Ostinato does, the Joyful Noise Ostinato lacks the quantum of originality needed to merit copyright protection. If we were to hold otherwise, it is hard to believe that any collection of pitches arranged in a flat rhythm could fail to meet the originality threshold. Even the Feist case recognizes that some works must fail the originality requirement. 
Therefore, plaintiffs failed to put forward legally sufficient evidence that Joyful Noise and Dark Horse are extrinsically similar works with respect to any musical features protectable under copyright law. Consequently, we affirm the district court's order vacating the jury award and granting judgment as a matter of law to defendants. Affirmed. So to summarize, the jury intrinsically decided that the two works and the ostinatos sounded substantially similar. The court then decided on motion from Katy Perry's lawyers or defendants' lawyers that the extrinsic test did not pass, that the joyful noise ostinato did not pass the objective test, that the ostinato itself was not enough to be copyright protected, and that the use of the ostinato as arranged in the overall song was not enough for the ostinato to be copyright protected. The songs are still copyright protected. This does not mean that Joyful Noise is not copyrighted or that Dark Horse is not copyright protected. This means that the eight note ostinato is not copyright protected. One of the other fatal flaws was that it was only a seven note ostinato. The eighth note was different. So it wasn't even a direct copy. If it had been a direct copy, that would be a different test. That would be a test of whether there was actual copying or not. Because it was not direct copying, it had to pass the substantial similarity test. And it didn't pass a substantial similarity test. I think we learned something or reinforced our understanding of copyright law with this case. I think that puts that case to bed. I seriously doubt that Flame and his lawyers will be appealing that to the Supreme Court. And if they did, I fully expect the Supreme Court to affirm this decision by denying Sergio Rari. We'll see what happens. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments below. And that's today's video. Special thanks to my top supporters in March, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hightoff, Ugly Grill, Good Broge, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Earthbound Star, Pure Magma, Tech Tech Potato, Eric Tams, The Blood Silk Survivors, and Wyatt Calandro. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJ French, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye. A musical scale is essentially a sequence of musical notes or tones ordered by pitch. How la, how lie or ho?